It's been called the world's largest machine, and it's one you probably don't think too much about. The electric grid. As our modern power needs grow, Inside Energy explores what's wrong with the grid and what can be done to fix it. So first off, what exactly is the grid? The power grid is a value chain associated with power generation, transmission, distribution, metering, and consumption. Sound complicated? It is. The grid isn't a single utility or power plant. It's a nationwide system of power plants, transmission lines, and substations that deliver the power they generate to your house. The system we have now dates back to a battle between Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse in the late 19th century. It was a war of the currents. Edison wanted small power plants delivering direct current to homes and businesses, and Westinghouse pushed for a centralized system of industrial power plants delivering alternating current across a network of power lines. Westinghouse won, creating the system we have today. The, the grid as it exists today it would be largely recognizable by Westinghouse and Edison. And the National Association of Engineers has identified the, the grid as the most significant scientific achievement of the 20th century. These days, Americans use a lot of electricity, more than all of Europe. And we increasingly rely on electricity to power every part of our lives. But the grid is also showing its age. There are lots of vulnerabilities to the electrical infrastructure right now. It is old, it is in need of repair. We do need to raise the level of uh, consciousness in America. This is a real problem. Solar storms threaten grid reliability, as does the challenge of new renewables coming online and outdated regulations. Inside Energy found that the number of outages has risen steadily from 2000 to 2014. And when the power goes out, it can cost billions. According to the Department of Energy, outages as a result of severe weather between 2003 and 2012 cost this country an average of between 18 and $33 billion per year. There's more than one solution, from fossil fuels. Whatever we do for energy, there's a price to pay. The argument that we're going to be having over the next 20 years is what is the price that we're willing to pay to renewables. It has to do with, with using the energy when it's there. To new smart grid technologies that change how we monitor the grid and communicate about problems. People talk about the Internet of Things. What the smart grid is really about is about the Internet of Energy. There's no failure, no outage, no safety issue, no customer satisfaction issue, and lower cost of operation. That's the future. Basically, changing the way our grid works all together. We have to pilot these things so we realize what the potential is in the future. So you can, you can have some lessons learned. And carefully planning new infrastructure so power can get to where it's needed. The worst thing that we can do is overbuild and have excess generation that our member owners have to pay for and we've got no ability to recover those costs. But fixing our electric grid will take political power. We are making the largest ever investment in a smarter, stronger and more secure electric grid. Billions of dollars and an increased awareness of the problem on the part of the American people. Many of you get your electricity from coal-fired power plants, like this one. And coal has long been the backbone of this country's electric grid. In fact, we still get around 39% of our electricity from it. Most of that coal comes from Wyoming. But the industry is struggling, and by 2020, dozens of coal-fired power plants will be retired. Some power operators say running the grid without that coal will be an enormous challenge. This is one of the reasons, a coal stockpile large enough to produce electricity for an entire month. You could probably play several games of flag football up here. We have about 30, 35 acres worth of, of land is involved in this. That's one of coal's benefits. It can be piled up right next to the power plant, ready to be made into electricity whenever. Natural gas and renewables are harder to store. 
So if there's a disruption, for example, in coal delivery by train. So by having this stockpile here, it provides a guarantee that the units will be able to operate morning, noon, night, whatever time of the day it might be. And so as the Environmental Protection Agency fights to implement a plan to cut carbon emissions from coal-fired power plants, warnings against those regulations are getting louder. Power plant operators will tell you that the EPA's regulations fail to adequately protect electric grid reliability. It's called the Clean Power Plan, and these regulations likely mean a lot more natural gas and renewables will come online. But that shift has actually been going on since the 1990s, and EPA officials strongly disagree that transitioning away from coal will threaten the flow of electricity. This rule will not threaten the reliability of the energy supply system. There is absolutely no way in which that needs to be the case. No matter how the clean power plant changes electricity generation, all sources of energy do have costs. Whatever we do for energy, there's a price to pay. And uh, I think as a nation, that's really what the argument that we're going to be having over the next 20 years is what is the price that we're willing to pay. As our power system changes, making our grid better and stronger is going to take some work. And the U.S. military is doing just that. It's adopting new technology to secure its power, like microgrids, grids that can basically operate all by themselves. Inside Energy's Dan Boyce went to Fort Carson in Colorado to see what it's doing to isolate its electricity from the rest of the grid. Here we go. Raymond Crockett is a supply specialist at Fort Carson Army Base. Um, you can basically consider us kind of like a Home Depot or uh, Ace Hardware for the, the post. He spends much of his day in a delivery truck, hauling stuff here and there. Here's your parts. All right, sir, you have a good day. All right. But when Crockett shows up and when he leaves, it's with a whisper. Yeah, it's, it's nice. All the guys say I sneak up on them. <laughs> His truck is one of a small fleet of electric vehicles driving around Fort Carson, ranging from carrying refrigerated goods to weapons to troops heading out to train. We really don't care what the vehicle does for its mission. It's just the fact that it's an electric vehicle that's doing it instead of a gasoline engine. Bill Wagaman leads energy security for U.S. Northern Command, the military's homeland defense arm. Fort Carson's electric vehicles make an important piece of the project on Wagaman's shirt. It's one of those clever government acronyms. SPIDERS is the Smart Power Infrastructure Demonstration for Energy Reliability and Security. Uh, let's just stay with calling it SPIDERS. Fort Carson is hooked up to the same electricity grid we all use, which is reliable the vast majority of the time. But Vince Guthrie, the base's utility manager, says independence has its advantages. If we ever run into that crisis someday where we have a long-term electric outage, you know, a hurricane, tr Katrina, some type of disaster, a terrorist event. If something like that happens, Spiders allows Fort Carson to run on its own power generated on site from these solar panels, diesel generators, and yeah, the electric trucks. In an emergency, the trucks can plug in and act as storage batteries for the electricity generated. Fort Carson is like a small village with houses and schools, but of the 95 buildings here, Wagaman says Spiders only really needs to be concerned with powering a few. They really only have three that we absolutely have to maintain the power to in order to do the mission like the data center and the headquarters command post. All of this helps with the security at this military base, makes the power here more reliable, but the suite of technologies being developed here could one day be implemented in all kinds of other sectors. And it already is. Some hospitals, jails, and universities have microgrids. Usually though, they rely on diesel generators. Fuel tankers have been anchored offshore in New York Harbor, waiting for the ports to open. Residents of hard-hit areas in New York and New Jersey have been suffering through major gas shortages. During Superstorm Sandy, diesel shortages racked the East Coast. Wagaman says generators failed in multiple hospitals from overuse. Renewables and batteries could make these microgrids more reliable. The military is an important testing ground for making sure these systems work. We play war, right? And so on the military installation, we can red team and we can 
basically attack our infrastructure from a cyber point of view. We have to pilot these things so we realize what the potential is in the future. So you can, you can have some lessons learned and, uh, and you can help drive those markets because a lot of these companies are still evolving their technologies. Well, this would be known as a utility scale microgrid. Some entrepreneurs though are trying to get ahead of the markets. We're heading north out of the Fort Collins, Loveland, Greeley area. Craig Harrison works in real estate. And out in an empty square mile of northern Colorado pasture, next to a 30,000 acre bison ranch. Here we are. Here we are. He has a vision, the Niobrara Energy Park. The world's largest planned microgrid. Because while this may seem like we're out in the middle of nowhere. Yet you're in the middle of everywhere when it comes to the infrastructure. Harrison Square Mile sits at the intersection of major electric transmission, natural gas pipelines, and one of the largest fiber optic hubs in the country. He wants to pool those resources and combine them with renewables on site. And then create secure power for mission critical items like data centers or military facilities that could be within this secure area. He's trying to court the big guys, the Googles or the Apples to come in and build. And he hopes to convince them his microgrid could be cheaper than buying the expensive diesel generators data centers normally rely on. He thinks the project could be worth $10 billion one day if microgrids really are the future. Green Tech Media Research says there are more than 120 microgrids in the country right now, and they predict the market for microgrids will grow nearly 270% by 2020. Running an electric grid, a microgrid or otherwise on renewables is tough because of their variability. But the Northern European country of Denmark is already doing it. They currently get 40% of their power from wind and are shooting for 100% by the year 2030. And to get there, they're not just changing their source of electricity or the way the grid is set up. They're trying to fundamentally change the way the people use electricity. Wyoming Public Radio's Stephanie Joyce went to the Danish island of Bornholm to learn more. Eric Momquist's job used to be a lot easier before renewable energy. Momquist runs the power grid for Bornholm, an island of 40,000 people off the coast of Denmark. The island's electricity consumption is fairly predictable. We can see people get up in the morning about uh, half past five. They're making something, and then they go to, to eat, so they just stop. And that's every day, and that's the, the curves we are uh, Making. But the island's electricity supply is becoming less predictable. Like most places, Bornholm used to get most of its power from coal and gas. But now, more than half comes from wind and solar, which fluctuate constantly. You can see the wind, and then suddenly it goes up and down all the time. Yeah, so it's very, very unstable. Wow. As Denmark adds more renewable energy, that mismatch between when electricity is being produced and when it's needed is a growing problem. But this sleepy fishing village is home to a cutting edge energy experiment that could make the variability of wind and solar less of a problem. Bornholm has branded itself the bright green test island and welcomed a series of futuristic experiments focused on the electric grid. The most ambitious experiment is called EcoGrid EU. At the demonstration house, project leader Maya Benson shows off how it works. So this is some of the equipment that we are using in the, in the project. The EcoGrid project shakes up the traditional relationship between electricity supply and demand. It gets people to use more power when there's lots available and less when there isn't. It's called demand response. So we have the control cylinder and then the lines for the wind turbines, for example. Benson uses a Lego model to help explain how demand response helps integrate wind and solar into the island's grid. It's something she learned about as a kid when her father installed a wind turbine on their property. When it was windy, we turned up the, all the radiator wells full open and, and could heat the house. But because it was windy the, and, and the, wind turbines, the wind turbine was spinning anyway, the energy was free and abundant. 
The EcoGrid experiment also relies on using more power when there's cheap, renewable energy available, and less when there isn't. But unlike when Benson was a kid, no one has to run around opening and closing radiator valves. A signal goes through to the gateway, and then a signal to the relay saying, turn off the heat pump because now the power price is high and we are within boundaries. The equipment gets information about the real-time price of electricity. When it's high, the equipment turns down the heating and turns it back on again when prices drop. So long as the temperature stays within a specified range, say 70 to 75 degrees. Demand response have nothing at all to do with energy savings. It has to do with, with using the energy when it's there. Which helps with balancing the grid, if it works. And uh, this is the part from the EcoGrid. They installed this one when I was signed in for the project. Katri Marlison lives on Bornholm and is a participant in the project. This is the, the price now. When it's red, it's expensive. But although Marlison can access real-time electricity prices through the project, the devices controlling her heating system stopped working months ago. The automation equipment still has some serious bugs. The idea of the project is really good, but then there's some technical problems that um, does that I can't use it the way it was uh, supposed to. Marlison sometimes checks the price before doing laundry or running the dishwasher, but those consume almost no electricity compared to heating and cooling. It's a shame that it can't work the way that it's supposed to do. She's not the only one who thinks so. Back on the mainland, I met Jürgen Christensen, the chief technology officer for Dansk Energi, the Danish Energy Association. He agrees it's a shame demand response isn't ready for prime time. So, so we are over-investing because we're not utilizing the, the, the energy that we produce in a smart way. Over-investing in things like transmission lines and backup power plants, which wouldn't be necessary if demand response worked better. Christensen is confident the technical problems with demand response will get sorted out. But he's worried that it will take time to convince people of the benefits Maybe too much time, given the country's renewable energy goals. If I would ask my sister whether she would have a flexible or smart charging of an electric vehicle or, or her heat pump, she would say, well, I haven't heard about it <laughs> today. So that's, that's where we are there. Uh, on the left side, you have a picture of Bornholm, uh, and the green dots are uh, substations. On the campus of the Danish Technical University, researchers are tackling both the technological and the consumer side of the problem. They've been analyzing the results of the Bornholm experiment and are excited about its promise. But Jakob Ustergaard, who's in charge of the lab, says what they've done so far is just the beginning and compares it to the nascent cell phone industry. Yeah, you could say that what we have developed is, is basically we have developed the smartphone and one app. The app being demand response. Now, in the analogy, Ustergaard wants to build other apps to transform electricity in the same way the smartphone changed the phone. He thinks in a few years, we won't even think about electricity the same way. Instead of buying kilowatt hours, uh, which are very difficult to understand how much is a kilowatt hour and what is it, you could, we could sell, uh, buy uh, comfort, for instance. We could buy 21 degrees Celsius in, in our house. That's a comfortable 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Whatever those new ways of thinking about electricity end up being, more likely than not, you'll find them on Bornholm first. But utility companies can be slow to adopt new technology. Meanwhile, growing populations in the American West need more electricity fast. Like in North Dakota, for example, the oil boom has attracted people to live and work. Those new residents and new oil fields require enormous amounts of electricity, and the state has struggled to meet that demand. So the region, in some ways, has become a sort of test case for how to electrify rural communities quickly. Inside Energy's Emily Guerin reports from Western North Dakota on how they're changing and growing their grid to meet new power demand. Driving around western North Dakota, you get the sense there are big changes happening to the electrical grid. These rural areas are crisscrossed with power lines, and everywhere you look, more are going up. 
Colin Trebus is a lineman for Watford Underground, an electrical contractor out of the oil field town of Watford City. He says the rural character of the area has totally changed. Oh yeah, like especially from when I was out here, I mean, it's completely different. None of this transmission line was here. I mean, everywhere you look, there's power lines. It's crazy. The Bakken oil field is what is driving the construction of all those new power lines. Each oil well uses as much electricity as three to four homes. In just five years, over 7,500 of them were drilled in the Bakken. That's like adding 30,000 houses to one of the least populated parts of the country. Oil wells are actually some of the least power intensive parts of the oil field, says Jason Iverson of Montreal Williams Electric Cooperative. They're a utility based in the heart of the Bakken oil field. Things like this gas compressor station use way more power than a single oil well. I would say that the power that's being used at this site alone is probably close to some of your smaller towns in North Dakota. Small North Dakota towns and rural homesteads. That's pretty much the only type of customer the electric cooperative served before the boom got started. Now it sells almost exclusively to oil companies, which use way more power than farmers. In 2007, Montreal Williams sold just over 270,000 megawatts of power. By 2014, it was over 2 million. Iverson says that kind of change takes some getting used to. I, I guess I think it changed the most in that all of a sudden we're dealing with a lot of different oil companies and we don't really know who they are because before we, we basically knew who we were providing power to. It was our neighbor or it was someone we'd seen at a ball game or at church or wherever. So we probably knew them by name, we knew where they lived. And if they had a power request, we'd drive out to their place and ask what they needed and try to provide it for them the best we could. Here is Tioga. So you can see each one of these are substations. Overseeing this transition from tiny rural electric cooperative to bustling industrial utility is Dale Haugen, the general manager of Montreal Williams Electric Cooperative. He says there's more behind the growth in electricity demand than oil wells and gas plants. It takes housing for people, it takes the crew camps, it takes um, all of the support industries and, and just apartments, apartments, apartments. I mean, we needed a workforce like you wouldn't believe to move into this region and that all requires electricity. Oil patch towns like Watford City have more than doubled in four years. And that's probably an underestimate because so many people are sharing homes and trailers. It was pretty clear that local utilities were going to need more power. But as a small rural electric cooperative, Montreal Williams just delivers the electricity. It doesn't own the power plants. It needed to buy more power from the utility that does, Basin Electric Power Cooperative. It's a big utility with 3 million customers in nine states. And in order to meet the power demands in the Bakken, they were going to need 1,500 megawatts of new power in 10 years. That's like two new coal-fired power plants just for the oil field. But first, Basin had to make sure the oil development and the increased demand for electricity were going to last. After all, this part of North Dakota had been through booms and busts before. So every one of these represent a five and a half megawatt generating unit. Steve Tomac explains. And as utilities, we're very concerned about overbuilding because the worst thing that we can do is overbuild and have excess generation that our member owners have to pay for and we've got no ability to recover those costs. Once they were convinced that this new demand was here to stay, they developed a three-pronged approach to meet it. First, they bought power from neighboring utilities that had extra. Second, they moved it into the area on new transmission lines. And third, they got started on their own new power plants, ones that run off natural gas produced in the Bakken. The fact that this plant runs on natural gas is actually a big deal. Most of Basin Electric's power plants run on coal. But under the Obama administration's new clean power plan, they'll probably have to switch to cleaner fuels. So what they're doing in the Bakken is a preview of what's to come. 
The new transmission lines, power plants, substations, all this adds up to a highly modern grid that can provide more power and is less prone to outages. That's one of the east-west routes that we're putting in to move traffic east to west across the Gene Veter is the director of economic development for McKenzie County. We're so, such a uh, remote area that there's not enough customers here to support a massive electrical uh, build out, but the oil industry can do that and consequently rural customers get better power for and keep their rates down. Even with low oil prices, electricity demand is still increasing, although not as fast as before. So utilities are still playing catch up. They probably will be for a while. In the next 20 years or so, companies hope to drill another 50,000 wells in the Bakken. Reinventing the grid will be a long and complex process, and Inside Energy will keep digging in. For more reporting on the grid, you can visit us at grid.insideenergy.org. Thank <laughs> you.